Can everybody hear me okay? All right. <laughs> um, so my favorite part of Grand Rounds presentations is usually my title. Uh, so mine is IC, but maybe not so well if you take pentosan polysulfate, PPS, and the risk of macular damage. Uh, I have no disclosures. Uh, so objectives, uh, brief outlines of IC BPS, and then brief outline of the AUA guidelines regarding IC and BPS, and then management of IC BPS, and then risks associated with uh, PPS treatment. Um, so interstitial cystitis and bladder pain syndrome uh, is a chronic condition involving bladder pain and discomfort. Uh, it's very poorly understood. Obviously, we have a lot of experts at Stanford um, and in the room uh, who do a lot of good work in IC and BPS, um, but this kind of poor understanding has resulted in some challenges with treatment. The current literature is definitely limited with high quality data demonstrating efficacious treatment. And as people may have experienced, there is no kind of silver bullet for IC or BPS. Um, and so treatment focuses mainly on symptom management and achieving an adequate quality of life. And there is no universal treatment for IC and it's just everything is tailored towards the individual patient. Uh, and you may usually need to use more than one modality for treatment. And so the AUA guidelines, the most recent one on ICBPS, uh, I think it's extremely well written. And I think as a resident, it's really helped me understand uh, kind of best next steps in treating patients who have IC and BPS. And so obviously with any patient, you wanna work up with a thorough history, uh, making sure that of course that, you know, there isn't like a UTI or a cancer or something that we're missing and they truly do have IC. Um, and although there's no universal treatment available for IC, if you suspect Hunter's ulcers, the recommendation is to perform a cystoscopy because treatments of, of those Hunter's ulcers should improve their symptoms. Uh, treatment categories, as is mentioned in the previous talk, includes behavioral, oral medication, intravesical installations, procedures, and major surgery. And as mentioned, there is no single effective treatment option. Usually multiple therapy options are needed. Um, so our main goal will be talking about guideline number 15, which is on pentosan polysulfate and the risk of macular damage. Uh, this over here is just a quick big summary of kind of the AUA guidelines, which starts off over here just talking about getting an adequate history. If you are suspecting something a little bit more complicated, it takes you down here to work up with further imaging, CT scans, uh, UDS, cystoscopy. Um, obviously, if there's an infection, treat that infection. If it is... If you suspect Hunter's ulcers, then you should do a cystoscopy, treat those Hunter's ulcers. If not, then kind of the categories that mentioned. And so behavioral management, you know, stress reduction, reducing triggers, uh, oral medications with, you know, tricyclic antidepressants, PPS, and so on and so forth, different intravesical installations, procedures, and then major surgeries, which we also talked about not too long ago. And so what does guideline 15 say? Uh, guideline 15 says that clinicians should consult patients who are considering pentosan polysulfate on the potential risk of macular damage and vision-related changes. This is a clinical principle. And so PPS is the only oral medication for IC that is FDA approved. Uh, the proposed me mechanism is that it reconstitutes the deficient protective glycose, so aminoglycan layer of the urothelium to minimize the oxidative stress as we talked about. Uh, improvements may take at least six months to see. So, you know, it's not treatment failure if they don't see any benefit within the first few months of treatment. Um, but the concern is that some of these folks can have difficulty reading, blurred vision, and worsened vision in low light environments. Um, and so this, uh, the, the concern is that this is cumulative. So the more milligrams and grams that you have of PPS in your system, the worse that things do get. And so for the AUA guidelines, the recommendation is to have a detailed ophthalmic examination and history prior to use. Um, and so if they do have a history, then you know, obviously making sure that they see an ophthalmologist and you know, have at least a good baseline examination. And then that there should be repeat examinations as they are on PPS, just to make sure that they are not developing these worsening symptoms. The American Urogynecologic Society also have their own recommendations. They talk about a lot of the same papers that I'll talk about uh, in this presentation. The only other one that they included that um, I just included kind of the big highlight points from is that they talked about a 500 gram of lifetime exposure of PPS resulted in 12.7% of patients having this characteristic maculopathy. And a 1500 gram of lifetime exposure resulted in about 41% of this characteristic maculopathy, which is a pretty high number. Um, and so the recommendations are overall the same as the AUA guidelines. Um, the only differences I think are kind of intuitive. One, obviously, 
talking to the patients about the risks of their medications that they take, which in theory we do for every medication that we prescribe patients in clinic. Um, and that some of the side effects they have, or sorry, that even after discontinuing the medication, they may still develop some of these side effects. Um, and then that practitioners should prescribe the medication at the lowest necessary dose and for the shortest duration of time, ideally limiting it to no more than 500 grams or less than five years of therapy. So the first kind of paper that they talk about, it's a very small cohort of patients. It's a, retrospe a retrospective study published in 2019. And so the population, it's a case series of patients examined by a single investigator at the Emory Eye Center between the years of 2015 and 17 with pigmentary maculopathy in the setting of chronic exposure to PPS. And so 38 patients uh, in this uh, institution used PPS, but only six were evaluated by the investigator. So this paper is literally about six patients. Um, they all underwent standard retinal imaging. Each patient was contacted for additional health information. Uh, the intervention was PPS exposure. The comparison was none, and the outcome was any visual changes. And so table one just shows kind of the breakdown in the study population. So looking at the far left, you can see there's six patients, all of which are female. Uh, the average age is 54. Uh, they are all white. And the time since interstitial, interstitial cystitis diagnosis was 20 years. Uh, age of onset of symptoms was approximately 50. Uh, the typical daily dose was close to 400 milligrams a day. And then looking at the duration of treatment, a lot of people, the median is up to 190 months. Um, and then the cumulative dose was 2.2 kilograms, which if you guys remember that Kaiser paper, which said about 40% of people had side effects of taking over 1500 grams. This is well above that. And then, so this table just kind of shows like the big picture takeaways and symptoms that folks had. And so the uh, first symptom for patient number five was metamorphopsia, which means it's hard to differentiate shapes and they kind of look a little blurred. I had to look that one up. Uh, paracentral scotomas, near vision difficulty. And then uh, pretty much everyone has difficulty with uh, low light settings. And then a lot of other people have difficulty reading. Um, pretty much there is no difference between the right and left eye. It pretty much affects both eyes the same way. And those are kind of the big takeaways. Uh, it is a very small study. Uh, so, you know, obviously it hints us at some of the side effects that, uh, one should investigate further, but also in their study, they didn't find a difference between the dosing and, uh, the cumulative dosing and the side effects or the duration, at least in this study. But this study was the inspiration of the next two studies that we'll talk about. And so this one over here, as mentioned, uh, it's a follow-up study to the previous study. Uh, this one is a slightly larger cohort, uh, but still not a robust size. And so this is patients with PPS exposure at four different sites. The Emory Eye Center, which we just talked about, the KCI Center in Michigan, Kellogg Eye Center, and then the Northern California Retina and Vitreous Associates here in Mountain View. Um, they had expert reviewers at each institution that reviewed the imaging, and they had two graders that um, were exposed to the available images that were able to grade them from one to three, one being the lowest grade, three being the worst vision changes. Um, the intervention was PPS exposure. There was no comparison. And then the outcome was just drug exposure, visual acuity, and retinal imaging characteristics. And so the results of this, there was 35 patients that they recruited in total with PPS-associated maculopathy out of the 404 patients. Uh, pathology was noted bilaterally in all patients. Pathology mainly focused uh, in the fovea. Uh, color fundus photography revealed paracentral hyperpigmented spots in 34 of 64 eyes. Uh, the median IC symptom duration was 19 years and PPS intake of 15 years. And the most commonly reported symptom was blurred vision in 17, prolonged dark adaptation in 17, and metamorphopsia in four patients. And then, as you can see, some of these patients also took tricyclic antidepressants, gabapentin, and so on and so forth. As we kind of discussed, a lot of patients are usually on more than one medication. And then a total of 21, 21, and 24 eyes received grades of one, two, and three. So grade three had the highest uh, number of eyes. And then median PPS duration of 16 years and cumulative dosing of 1.6 kilograms. Uh, and then no difference found between the cumulative dose and disease severity or visual acuity. So both those two studies didn't show a difference of the more dose you took of the medication, the worse your side effects were. This over here is a very busy slide, but this is literally just what I, it doesn't even show up well at all, um, is pretty much what I just discussed right now. Um, so weakness of the study, it's also a retrospective study. Um, 
it's a small sample size and they do have no comparison. So you don't know if this is just, you know, a random correlation. And so then this study I thought was probably obviously with its weaknesses as well was probably the best out of the three. Um, and so this is a much larger study as a follow up to that first study. And so it was a retrospective match cohort study using US insurance claims database. Um, and so the exposure cohort was created from all patients who filed a prescription for PPS between the years of 2002 and 2016. The index date was at the first time you uh, got a, picked up a prescription of PPS. Uh, you were excluded if you did not have at least two years of data prior to the index date and any retinal problems and not at least five years of follow-up. Intervention was PPS used. And the comparison was unexposed cohort matched uh, five to one on age, sex, race, and insurance start date. And then outcome was any new diagnosis of atypical maculopathy and any new diagnosis of age-related macular degeneration or juicin. And so these are the two main cohorts. So the first one, table one, was five-year follow-up. Table three is seven-year follow-up. And so for the five-year follow-up, there is uh, about 15,000 patients who did not take Elmeron. And then there's 3,000 patients who had taken Elmeron. And then in table three, uh, for the seven-year follow-up, the no Elmeron group was 8,000 and uh, the Elmeron group was 1,600. And so for table one, there was pretty much no statistical significant difference, except in peripheral vascular disease, malignancy, chronic kidney disease, arrhythmia, and hypertension for table one. And table three, it's pretty much the same exact thing, peripheral vascular disease, malignancy, uh, previous myocardial infarction, arrhythmia. All of these things were uh, controlled for on multivariate uh, analysis that we'll talk about in this slide over here. So table two shows univariate and multivariate analysis, um, which is table two is the top one. And so this is that five-year follow-up. And so at what five-year follow-up, looking at the no Elmeron group versus the Elmeron group on univariate and multivariate analysis, there is no statistically significant difference between the two groups. Um, when looking at atypical maculopathy plus age-related macular degeneration, there similarly is no significant difference at five years. Uh, at seven years, however, in the first group, looking at just atypical maculopathy alone, uh, there was no statistically significant difference, although we do get a little bit closer and then looking at atypical maculopathy and age-related macular degeneration between the no Elmeron and Elmeron group, there is a statistically significant difference on univariate and multivariate analysis with P of 0.02 for univariate and P of 0.009 on multivariate. And then once again, they're controlling for the peripheral vascular disease, AFib, um, malignancy, and so on and so forth. And then they also did a sensitivity analysis looking at patients who just had a diagnosis of cystitis at five and seven years just to make sure that, you know, it's not just uh, the atypical maculopathy isn't just from having interstitial cystitis, but it's actually from your PPS exposure. And so at five years, there was 2,000 patients that had Elmeron exposure and there were about 10,000 controls. Multivariate analysis demonstrated significantly increased odds for atypical maculopathy with odds ratio of 2.91 and a confidence interval that does not cross one at five-year follow-up. Uh, this was insignificant if you looked at atypical maculopathy and age-related macular degeneration. And then at seven-year follow-up, there was 1,000 patients that had Elmeron exposure, and there were about 5,000 controls. Multivariate analysis demonstrated no statistically significant difference between the two groups. Uh, and then PPS use was also evaluated at five years. It was only 312 days. Uh, and then at seven years, 391 days, so 10 months and 13 months. So that's probably the lowest uh, exposure out of the, any of the studies that we've talked about. So yeah, although that this is five and seven year follow-up, they really did not take the drug for those durations of time. And so limitation, I think, of this study is the uh, duration of PPS use. Um, and then, that, of course, all the limitations that come with using an insurance claims database, not really having... Uh, you know, eye exams that maybe everyone would have gotten, and then benefits, large database, and this one actually has controls compared to the other studies. And so summary, ICBPS is a heterogeneous disease that is challenging to treat. PPS is the only FDA approved oral drug for IC, but the literature has demonstrated concern for macular disease with chronic use based on limited data. It is as far as relatively low quality, and, uh, but has generated reasonable concern. Um, so this concern manifested in AUA guideline number 15, which recommends ophthalmic 
examinations and history before use and periodically during use. And then additionally, the AUGS recommends to discuss possible visual side effects when using PPS and prescribing the medication at the lowest dose necessary and for the shortest duration. And that is all I have. Thank you very much.